This morning we're going to continue a series on the Lord's Prayer entitled, Lord Teach Us to Pray. It comes from Luke 11, verse 1. It says, Now Jesus was praying in a certain place, and when he finished, one of his disciples said to him, Lord, teach us to pray, as John taught his disciples. We're going to look at Matthew 6, verse 12 this morning. Forgive us our debts as we also have forgiven our debtors, which comes after last week we read and learned about, give us this day our daily bread. And a quote for the notes is, God has made us to need bread. We have made ourselves to need pardon. I'll say that again. God has made us to need bread. We have made ourselves to need pardon. We have this daily need for forgiveness, as we read here. Forgive us our debts. And I wonder what the disciples were thinking when, when Jesus said this to them. Forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And so we look at the Old Testament. Second Chronicles 7.14 says, If my people are called by my name, humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then I will hear from heaven and will forgive their sins and heal their land. Psalm 145, 18 says, The Lord is near to all who call on him, to all who call on him in truth. Numbers 14, 19 through 21 says, Please, please pardon the iniquity of this people according to the greatness of your steadfast love, just as you have forgiven this people from Egypt until now. Then the Lord said, I have pardoned according to your word, but truly as I live, and as all the earth shall be filled with the glory of the Lord. Daniel 9, 9 through 10 says, To the Lord our God belong mercy and forgiveness, for we have rebelled against him and have not obeyed the voice of the Lord, our God, by walking in his laws, which, we set be which he set before us by his servants, the prophets. And Joel 2, 12 through 13. Yet even now, declares the Lord, return to me with all your heart, with fasting, with weeping, with mourning, and rend your hearts, not your garments. Return to the Lord, your God, for he is gracious and mercy, slow to anger, and abounding in steadfast love. Our God is a forgiving God. Forgiveness in this verse is not a judicial forgiveness of our sins. That was taken care by Christ on the cross. This forgiveness is more akin to the forgiveness of a father to a loved child when they have done something wrong. So keep short accounts with God. I've heard it said. So I never quite understood it, but keep short accounts with God. It's kind of like this. You want to drink, something to eat after service, you walk across the street to the restaurant there, and you're walking, you have a pebble in your shoe. You're going to walk the whole way with the pebble in your shoe, annoying you? Or are you going to take the shoe off, take the pebble out, and then continue the journey? Likewise to prayer. Keep short accounts with God. Don't end the journey and then, oh yeah, by the way, all this, please forgive me. This forgiveness that we talk about in this verse is more of a day-to-day -day cleansing when we confess our sins to restore fellowship with our Heavenly Father. This is not the cleansing that comes from salvation by grace through faith, but it is like what we see in John 13, 10, when he washes the feet. He says, the whole body is clean, told the disciples, but their feet were dirty from walking in the world, that daily walk. How do we get this forgiveness? Well, we know confession it comes through confessing. As we're made aware, we acknowledge our sin towards God. Psalm 32, 5 says, I acknowledge my sin to you, and I did not cover my iniquity. I said, 
I will confess my transgression, transgressions to the Lord, and you forgave my iniquity of my sin, the iniquity of my sin. Psalm 38, 18 says, I confess my iniquity. I'm sorry for my sin. Proverbs 28, 13 says, Whoever conceals his transgressions will not prosper, but he who confesses and forsakes them will obtain mercy. Confession is this reconnection to God when we have sinned and kept ourselves apart from him. So we go next. Forgive us our debts. Keeping that short account with God. Two, as we also have forgiven our debtors. And I struggled with this one for a bit. Because it, it kind of makes it sound like, well, in order for God to forgive us, we need to forgive others, which is not truly the case. This forgiving others really starts with love for others. Luke 10, 27 says, And he answered, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength, and with all your mind, and love your neighbor as yourself. We start with love. And why do we start with love? 1 John 4.19 says we love because he first loved us. So with forgiving others, we start with love. And then we see in fellowship, James 5.16, Therefore confess your sins to one another and pray for one another that you may be healed. The prayer of a righteous person has great power as it is working. So allow God's grace and mercy to be an example of this forgiveness. How we've been forgiven by the Father, we too can forgive others. However, we can also not forgive others, right? We can be bitter, we can be angry in life. But Ephesians 1, 7, 8 says, In him we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of all our trespasses, according to the riches of his grace, which he has lavished upon us in all wisdom and insight. If we know what God has done for us and truly embrace that, can we extend that grace to other people in our lives? Or we stay bitter and angry. Tim Keller said in his book on forgiveness, he said, forgiveness is a form of voluntary suffering. In forgiving, Rather than retaliating, you make a choice to bear the cost. So just as Christ has absorbed our sins, we too, in those against us, make that suffering and absorb that cost. See, a lack of forgiveness of us forgiving others has an impact on both our fellowship with God and our prayer life. There's some sort of a hindrance in our walk when we don't extend that grace that God has given us. So just as we have been forgiven in Christ, so let us forgive others their trespasses, their shortcomings, their debts, revealing God's grace, that grace and mercy that we have received. 1 Peter 2, 21 through 24 says, For this you have been called, because Christ also suffered for you, leaving you an example, so that you might follow in his footsteps. He committed no sin, neither was deceit found in his mouth. When he was rivaled, he did not rival in return. When he suffered, he did not threaten, but continuing, continued entrusting himself to him who judges justly. He himself bore our sin in his body on the tree that we might die to sin and live to righteousness. By his wounds, we were healed. Matthew 7, 12 says, For whatever you wish that others would do to you, do also to them, for this is the law and prophets. 
Mark 11:25 says, "And whatever you st- whenever you stand praying, forgive if you have anything against anyone, so that your Father also, who in heaven, may forgive you your trespasses." There's this connection between God's forgiveness us and us forgiving others. It's an important thing and something that we shouldn't lack in our lives, that forgiving. God's love leads us to loving others. It's a part of forgiveness. Right? If, we don't, if God didn't love us, would he have forgiven us? If we don't love others, would we forgive others? John 13, 34 through 35 says, A new commandment I give to you, that you love one another, just as I have loved you. You also love one another. By this, all people will know that you are my disciples if you have love for one another. First Peter 4, 8 says, Above all, keep loving one another earnestly, since love covers a multitude of sins. It's important. Anyone who refuses to to give forgiveness clearly has not truly understood or received Christ's forgiveness towards us. We should forgive others as God has forgiven us. Uh, Spurgeon once said, to be forgiven is such sweetness that honey is tasteless in comparison with it. But yet there is one thing still sweeter, and that is forgive, to, to forgive. It is more blessing to forgive than to receive, or give to than receive. So to forgive rises a stage higher in experience than to be forgiven. To sum this up in Matthew 18, verse 21, we see the parable of the unforgiven servant. If you have your Bibles, you can open to that. Matthew 18, 21. Then Peter came up and said to him, Lord, how often... Will my brother sin against me, and I forgive him? As many as seven times? Jesus said to him, I do not say to you seven, but seventy times seven. Therefore, the kingdom of heaven may be compared to a king who wished to settle accounts with his servants. When he began to settle, one, who brought, one was brought to him who owed him ten thousand talents. And since he could not pay, his master ordered him to be sold with his wife and children and all that he had and payment be made. But when that same servant went out, sorry, skip one. Made. So the servant fell on his knees, imploring him, have patience with me and I will pay you everything. And out of pity for him, the master of the servant released him and forgave the debts. But when, when that same servant went out, he found one of his fellow servants who owed him a hundred denarii. And seized him, he began to choke him and said, pay for what you owe. So his servant fell down and pleaded with him, have patience with me and I will pay you. He refused and went and put him in prison until he should pay his debt. When his fellow servants saw what had taken place, they were greatly distressed, and they went and reported to their master all that had taken place. Then this master summoned him and said to him, You wicked servant, I forgave you all your debt because you pleaded with me. And should you not have had mercy on your servant, on your fellow servant, as I have mercy on you. And in anger, his master delivered him to the jailer until he should pay all his debts. So also my heavenly father will do to every one of you if you do not forgive your brother from your heart. This showing the example of forgiving others as we have been forgiven. 
There's a few things in this passage that we see. One, we see the unlimited forgiveness. Seven times? No, seven times 70. So just a lot of forgiveness. We also see the reciprocal action, right? A lack of forgiveness equals a lack of forgiveness. But forgiveness equals forgiveness. We also see grace, God's grace is unlimited. His grace is sufficient to cover our debt. We see the greater and the lesser. Such a big debt that God has forgiven us and such a small debt we to forgive others. And then we have breaking the, um, the cycle of revenge. See, our culture's seemingly obsession with cancel culture and finding reasons to ruin people's lives or reputation gives Christians, gives us, out of love, a chance to show a better way to live by being honest about our need for grace and others' need for grace. So at this time, as the worship team comes up, by way of inspiring or encouraging, we may have issues forgiving people in our lives, right? Maybe a boss did something, a coworker, a family member, even somebody we're really close to. But sin is serious, and sin needs to be dealt with. God's desire is that we truly and fully understand his forgiveness and extend his grace in love to those who are in our lives. So forgive others as God has forgiven us. Amen? We are going to continue in worship through communion at this time. Um, those of you that are serving, if you would... Come down. For I've received from the Lord what I also pass to you. The Lord Jesus, on the night he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it. And he gave it to his disciples and said, This is my body, which is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, after supper, he took the cup, and when he had given thanks, he said, this is the cup, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink in remembrance of me. For when you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim my death until I come again. Paul tells us that we should examine ourselves before we take the bread and cup. So I'd encourage you this morning to do that and to think about this sermon, think about the Lord's Prayer and its implications on our life. Take some time to confess any sin you need to confess to God. And then when you're ready, come down one of the angled aisles, take the bread, take the cup, bring them back to your seat, and we'll partake together.